and introduce the next of two sessions, panel, panel two, the techniques and technologies, part one and part two. We have a lot of speakers, a lot of new, fresh new ideas and new perspectives, and I have the pleasure of first introducing Isabel Canet, who's an early career scientist uh, who's primarily focusing on uh, um, gravity analyses, satellite gravity analyses, and also has worked with um, tsunami uh, detection as well. So Isabel, are, are you on? Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. Does it work with the, the PowerPoint? Yes. Yeah. Yep. That's great. Beautiful. Okay, okay so hello. Um, I'm presenting our work on the analysis of the Tohoku earthquake from uh, GRACE satellite gravity. So we analyze a uh, time series of uh, the Earth gravity field that was mapped from the GRACE satellite mission uh, with intermediate temporal and spatial resolution, a monthly temporal resolution and a spatial resolution down to uh, typically 400 kilometers. So with this resolution, uh, we made uh, it's an advantage in order to bridge the gap between local and global patterns of plate dynamics, uh, because we can tackle the regional scales and put a local event uh, into its broader uh, regional context. So in this study, we have uh, searched for possible episodic mass transfer at the scale of the Earth's regional structure near plate boundaries. So from GRACE, uh, we can detect the co-seismic and the post-seismic signatures of uh, giant earthquakes, as shown here for the Sumatra 2004 earthquake, with a great sensitivity to broad-scale mass variations, like crustal dilation in the co-seismic and uh, uh, broad-scale post-seismic, well explained by uh, mantle relaxation. And uh, here we focused on uh, anomalies before a giant rupture. And we analyzed two sets of uh, GRACE GWID models. Uh, and I'm uh, now introducing our method. So uh, the particularity is that uh, we did not try to reach the highest possible spatial resolution. Instead, we focus on the intermediate spatial scale. Uh, if we move to smaller scale, the anomalies concentrate near the epicenter. And if we move to larger spatial scales, the signals progressively vanish. So there is nothing more here uh, to learn. And uh, at these intermediate scales, we search for possible signals uh, correlating with the geometry of the plate boundaries, that is, uh, elongated gravity variations along uh, the orientations of the plate boundaries or the slab. And uh, we introduce this direction information by uh, using gravity gradients, rather than uh, uh, GWID or intensity of the gravity field. Uh, so these are the second order derivatives of the gravity potential uh, and uh, the idea is simple. Uh, if you have a mass excess uh, like uh, shown here, you have an increase in the gravity intensity above the source and also a deflection of the gravity vector towards the source. And so if we take a direction perpendicular to the axis of the source, uh, and uh, we map uh, the, the rate of variation of the component of the gravity vector in this direction. We have a sharper delineation uh, of uh, the mass anomaly than when we look at the geoid. So it's uh, useful uh, to uh, extract uh, a signal, an elongated signal along a direction of interest and separate it from uh, the other superimposed signals in the gravity field. And so here we have computed these gravity gradients as shown in this example uh, corresponding to a big thrust slip, which is not supposed to be realistic. And uh, they are computed in a spherical frame and we rotate the frame progressively. And uh, when the frame vector are parallel or perpendicular to the source orientation, we have a maximum intensity, uh, slowly decreasing as we keep rotating. 
And uh, this way, we obtain time series of gravity gradients at different spatial scales and for different orientations. And we study the temporal evolution, the time variations uh, in this time series, and we search for abrupt variation near the time of the earthquake. But we do not impose uh, the exact timing of the variation. We leave uh, a little bit of freedom. And uh, actually, we have carried out two different uh, kind of analysis. One where we analyze the entire time series, uh, including uh, years of observation after uh, the rupture, uh, which, is, which is shown here. And another one where we stopped the time series in February 2011, so we don't know uh, there will be a, a, a rupture coming. Uh, and uh, near Japan, both uh, agree quite well. Uh, so I will present the first one. And uh, in this approach, uh, we search for uh, step-like changes in the time series, and we do not impose the exact timing of the step. Uh, we leave freedom. It could be it could uh, start a few months uh, before or after March, and uh, so it's uh, a bit, little bit long to explain. Uh, but this way, we have uh, shown that the step-like changes uh, of, the of the time series around Tohoku, they start a few months uh, before the rupture uh, in a regionally coherent way over a wide area, as shown on the left map, uh, where we have a gravity gradient increase, which is uh, spatially coherent uh, over uh, one to 1,500 kilometers along uh, uh, the northwestern uh, Pacific subduction, and at the same time, a gravity gradient decrease south of the triple junction, and which is followed uh, also by a regional scale uh, change in March 2011. And this pattern of variation, they contrast very much with uh, the result of our analysis in the rest of the area delimited by the blue line, where we do not have uh, such, uh, such consistency. And it's really a regional scale variation. So now if we focus <laughs> closer uh, to the epicenter, uh, we can see a uh, whole dynamics of variation of the gravity field that uh, unfolds over time uh, with uh, this regional change uh, uh, starting before the rupture. Uh, we do not find them at smaller spatial scale. It's a, it's a broad scale pattern uh, continued in March and uh, afterwards uh, concentration <laughs> of the gravity signals, progressive concentration, first on the trench and then slower uh, variation on the uh, oceanic side uh, of the subduction. So we have uh, ca <laughs> carried out uh, many tests uh, to uh, compare this uh, gravity variation before the rupture with uh, water signal, uh, water signals in the gravity field or uh, the brace geoid artifacts. Uh, and uh, we concluded that uh, they have a highly unusual a spatial pattern and amplitude. Uh, you can see, for instance, here in a point in northern Japan, uh, we can see a large deviation in the annual uh, snow cycle marked by uh, starting uh, in uh, December 2010, uh, which corresponds to the, the blue point in the time series, while March is uh, in, uh, in pink. And uh, uh, so in, in all the points uh, of, uh, of these anomalies, we have a progressive increase of the gravity gradient uh, over a few months instead of a sharp one in March, as we can observe if, if we move uh, to points uh, closer to the epicenter where we do not have anything uh, in the months before, but really a sharp step in March. So we give uh, an extensive discussion uh, that uh, this behavior is extremely unusual. Uh, it appears persistent uh, in the gravity field. Uh, it has a large amplitude with respect to usual water signals and noise in this area. And uh, it, it's a special pattern also does not match uh, with that uh, of the usual uh, uh, water signals in particular. That's why we have proposed uh, that uh, it could uh, reflect a deformation of the solid earth before the earthquake. <clears throat> 
And, uh, and so uh, we notice first the consistent uh, orientation of both uh, the anomaly before the rupture and in March, which is that of the regional subduction orientation, not the local orientation, the regional one, and the eastward displacement of the gravity signals. <laughs> and based on these characteristics, we have proposed uh, uh, that uh, this gravity variation could reflect a uh, slow uh, deformation propagating from depth to surface within the entire subduction system and the rupture would occur as the extreme event uh, within this broader and slower uh, deformation pattern uh, propagating within two oceanic plates. Uh, the anomaly coincides, can be explained by a mass decrease uh, and it coincides with the Pacific slab at depths around uh, 250 kilometers, typically where uh, seismicity uh, vanishes uh, and uh, it uh, precedes at uh, depths uh, shallower acceleration of the seismic release that has been reported. Another peculiar point is the March 2011 co-seismic signal. If we compare the GRACE observed co-seismic signal on the left with that modeled uh, from uh, co-seismic slip models based on uh, surface motion, uh, the amplitudes agree very well, but uh, the orientation and, and the spatial extent are not the same. Uh, the uh, surface uh, motion constraint model, they align with the local strike of the subduction, whereas the GRACE one, they align with the regional strike of the subduction, and uh, they extend on the oceanic side uh, much more. So it indicates a larger deformation pattern near the rupture than from surface motion. Uh, last, uh, yes? Okay. okay, you're finishing up. Quick. Finish. I'm finished. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, a last point uh, where when we stopped the analysis in uh, February 2011 and we simply map uh, anomalously large variation, we can detect around Japan uh, a consistent uh, pattern structure of anomaly in the middle of uh, among a few other large ones. Uh, and I will stop, uh, I will stop now uh, that uh, we think we have a unique probe on a deeper and slower motion uh, near plate boundaries from satellite gravity and that uh, systematic investigation need to be carried out uh, uh, for all the events resolved, for, uh, resolved by GRACE. Okay, and I stop. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, what we're going to do, um, to, uh, we're going to have a broader discussion at the end, so I hope you can stay on until the end of this yes. session, and then we'll have general questions to all speakers. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, so we'll move on next um, to uh, optimizing subduction zone monitoring, or Sarah, who was just previewed slightly in this talk as well. Go ahead. So I'm Sarah, and I am going to give a brief talk, and then later I will entertain questions. And by entertain, I mean tap dance or shadow puppets. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to be able to answer that, because this is a study that um, involves three of us, me, Eileen Evans, and Ben Brooks. My contribution was to develop the mathematical framework. And because I like you all too much to make you sit through a talk about math, I'm going to skip over that part and only present the part to Eileen and Ben, i.e. the parts they did not work on. Um, so, subduction zones, interesting things happen in them. And so, for example, if you wanted to um, find out about the in a subduction zone, you'd need to figure out the tectonic rate in it and also what rate is keeping on in distributed format. Um, and so, hello. Do I need to make this work? Ah, woo! -hoo. And when we go out and try and do that, we get many different coupling models. And if you look at the Antonyan coupling model, they are very large in those trends, which is going to be a hint that what we need is probably actual observations. Um, and because we haven't yet talked about how these things work, let me put in a few slides to explain how people geodesy work. So on land geodesy, very nice. Put in a GPS with people, it gets information from GPS satellites. It positions itself easy peasy. Um, if you try and run it, if you want to figure out what's going on on the seafloor, though, things get very messy. Typically, what you do is you put sonar transponders on the seafloor and then you send out, for example, a boat, which then pings the, the transponders and positions itself as 
and bundles, and then it uses GPS to talk to satellites and position itself. So in order to get an observation, you have to send a boat out, which is very expensive. Um, a flight control option is what's called a wave glider, and so these are unmanned vehicles. They involve the differential vertical motion between the top of the sea surface and the sea at depth to um, and converts that into forward motion to propel the craft and they can be sealed remotely using satellite communications. Okay, so what can we absorb? So with um, C4 Geodesy, GPS Acoustic, GPS A, principally sensitive to horizontal motion, sub-centimeter position after three to four days of observation. Uh, we also have C4 pressure gauges that are sensitive to vertical motion and also have centimeter level precision. And then there's other kinds of sensors in various stages of development, for example, C4 strain. Um, but the big question is, what mode do you operate these things in? So um, typically they are, they are operated through repeat occupation, right? You send out a ship or a wave glider to come visit the transponders and figure out um, what their position is, but you only do this in sort of a campaign mode. Alternatively, you could use continuous telemetry. Um, this uses a lot of power. That means you have to change batteries frequently. And sometimes you might need additional infrastructure, like a buoy positioned over C4 transponders. So that's even more expensive. Um, alternatively, if you really want continuous data, you can cable these instruments. That's continuous telemetry and continuous power, and that is so very expensive. Um, but the mode that you choose will determine what kind of transients or precursors, if any, you can absorb. Whatever you choose, it's going to be really expensive, and we're not going to get a lot of observations. So it's really important to make these observations in the places where it counts. So let's do, let's figure out the answer to that question. Where do we need to make C4 geodetic observations? Where is the most important place to get new data? And to do that, we're going to use a quantity called information entropy or differential entropy. Um, that is the amount of missing information about the value of a parameter. Fun fact, it can also be defined as the average number of yes or no questions you'd have to ask to guess the value of that parameter. Um, so you do a bunch of math, and you can come up with an answer to what is the entropy in your solution. How much uncertainty do you have about whatever it is you're trying to absorb? And this answer is independent of what that value turns out to be, right? It doesn't, for example, if I'm interested in coupling, it doesn't matter whether it turns out that the subduction zone is highly coupled or completely uncoupled, or if it's homogeneous across the subduction zone, or if it's very heterogeneous and it looks like a checkerboard or something. That doesn't matter. But it does matter that you said that you wanted to go out and absorb coupling at some sort of spatial resolution. If you decide you care about a different spatial resolution, or if you decide you care about a completely different physical property, like maybe the total moment rate deficit across the entire subduction zone, then you can get a different answer because you're saying, I want to make inference about a different quantity. And note, entropy is bad. That is uncertainty. You want to minimize entropy in order to know more about what's going on in the subduction. OK, so I gave this framework to Eileen, and she said, OK, let's apply this forth to looking at the coupling problem. Let's try and estimate coupling in the Cascadia subduction zone. So what she did is she discretized the subduction zone using these um, triangular patches that you see here, and she embedded it in this overall block model. And she said, okay, we already have data from these existing 4,213 DNSS sites, and then we're going to consider 4,000 potential new observation locations. And we're going to look at all these potential observation locations and ask which ones minimize information entropy, which give us the most information about coupling. Um, some more details, the assumed uncertainties, both on the um, onshore data, the offshore data that we might potentially be looking at, and also the oil pores used in the block model. Okay, and so this is a map of how much entropy decreases, how much we have learned as a function of where we make observations. Blue is a big decrease in entropy, that's good, we've learned a lot. And uh, what you can see, and uh, the the triangle is on the existing um, onshore GPS network. And so what you see is blue is the Juan de Fuca plate. The single most important thing you can do is go out and get a good observation of the Juan de Fuca plate because that gives you the relative plate rate. Um, and so 
there was a little animation here that shows where you put additional stations at that false run again it's all you always put at the bluest spot and basically it starts filling in the trench because that's where all the uncertainty was in the coupling models so number one figure out what your plate rate is and number two start filling in the trench where the most uncertainty was in your coupling model now again this was for doing coupling right if you said you run into something else like total moment deficit maybe you would get a different answer what it says is that the first 21 additional places you would want to make observations of are all offshore. Um, you, it's not until the 22nd observation that goes, you know what, there's a little gap in my GPS network on shore. I could use another observation wheel. And so this is a plot of how much entropy decreases as you add in new additional stations. And again, the first um, onshore station comes 21 um, stations in. Now, alternatively, you could say, okay, but I could also learn more if I identified my onshore GPS network. How much would I learn if I put that, if I instead of putting out, you know, 30 um, potentially offshore stations, I went out and put out 30 new stations on land, and whatever location was best to increase our observation capacity using just land-based observations. And that looks like this. It also decreases the entry, but not nearly as much as putting out stations on land. In fact, it would take 18 additional GPS stations to learn as much as you would learn by taking one offshore measurement. So, I can just wrap up. Um, 27 of the four study optimal observations are offshore. And one single offshore station like um, as much information as you get from 18 onshore stations. Now, we didn't go the extra step and ask, well, which makes more dollars and cents sense because that depends exactly how you run the offshore instrument, right? How expensive it is depends on how often you want to revisit it or whether you're cabling it or whether you're experimentaling it. So, and, again, and also the answer for where you want to put your stations depends on the quantity you want to absorb. But this is a framework that lets us say, if you tell us what you want to absorb, how, how much you need to absorb it, how often you need to absorb it to get to, and where you need and what it is you're trying to absorb, we can tell you where you need to make observations in order to learn as much as possible about that quantity. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for introducing the C4 geodesy component as well. So, well, thank you. Um, our next speaker is Bruce Haynes from NASA uh, Sea Surface GPS Recent Advances. Okay, thanks for uh, inviting me here today. Uh, I'm going to be trying to answer one of the questions uh, that was raised in the briefing book about new instrumentation and techniques to help uh, lend insight on uh, precursory events. And uh, this uh, relates to uh, GPS and uh, sea surface systems. Uh, this is a collaborative effort between uh, NASA JPL and uh, NOAA PMEL. They have a lot of experience deploying buoys around the world for various different uh, experiments. Okay, so uh, this uh, project originally um, initiated with some seed funding from a NASA ROSES call, and the object objectives are to de design, build, and test a modular, low power, robust, high accuracy. GPS system. We now sort of use the words GPS and GNSS interchangeably. GNSS refers to the overall satellite uh, constellation, which could include the Chinese, Russian, and European systems in addition to GPS. Uh, and we want to focus on continuous and autonomous operations and move away from campaign style uh, buoy measurements and also ensure that we can get the data back uh, in, uh, in near real time. And this is for both ocean and cryosphere applications. You heard from Paul about precise point positioning earlier. There have been a lot of advances in precise point positioning in the last decade that allow us to basically determine sea surface height of a buoy that's isolated from reference stations. Uh, we want to take advantage of that. And then also explore potential scientific benefits, especially in the fields of physical oceanography, but also weather. We can measure precipitable water from the buoy very accurately which has important implications for forecasting atmospheric rivers, also space weather, uh, ionosphere obviously from the GPS measurements and the potential to potentially uh, uh, also measure transient uh, uh, traveling ionospheric disturbances, which I think have been uh, used for uh, seismic purposes. Uh, 
Uh, and so what I'd like to, to try to convince you of is that, uh, you know, I think people have known that we've been doing GPS buoy research for a long time now, almost 30 years. I think the first paper was published in the late 1980s. What makes the time unique now? I think it's ripe for the development of a, of a global GNSS ocean network. And there's a, several things that have come together recently that have conspired to make this the right time. One is the emergence of these new satellite systems, which I referred to. Uh, this is important for kinematic applications because oftentimes, because it, especially in a buoy, it's, it could potentially be pitching and heaving pretty violently from waves. And so you want as many observations as possible. So if you're tracking more than just GPS and you're tracking Beidou and other constellations, you have a better observing geometry. Uh, the second factor is advances in miniature high accuracy receivers. When we first started doing this, uh, a couple decades ago, the scientific grade receivers were, were bigger, they drew more power. Now we, uh, we have uh, credit card size scientific grade receivers that draw about a watt, okay? Uh, innovations in precise point positioning, I mentioned that earlier, enabling high accuracies without dedicated reference stations. And then also uh, a lot of new potential uh, robotic ocean faring platforms. We have sail drones, uh, liquid robotics has this wave glider system. And NOAA, I'm also showing one of the advanced NOAA buoys, uh, which is the one we're actually using. It's from the DART uh, system. So there's broad scientific and societal benefits, as I mentioned earlier, not just for C4 geodesy, but for studying sea level, for calibrating satellite altimeters, for measuring uh, both uh, properties of the neutral atmosphere and the charged particles, and also for natural hazards, of course, which is why we're here today. So here's our prototype buoy. Uh, it's uh, <clears throat> got a tiny GPS uh, credit card size receiver, which is shown in the upper right there, draws about one watt. It tracks all of those satellites I described earlier, not only GPS, but also GLONASS, Beidou, and, uh, <clears throat> and the uh, new Galileo system. It's got a little miniaturized digital compass accelerometer inside. To get the data back in real time, we use Iridium Communications. We can't yet get back the uh, one hertz data. Uh, we're pulling back lower rate data. I'll describe that in more detail later. It's adaptable to uh, multiple floating platforms, not just buoys, but hopefully also sail drones and wave gliders. And it enables geodetic quality solutions without nearby reference stations. And so I'm not gonna go through some of the development and testing in detail here, but suffice to say, we've had this approach of taking baby steps where we first put the buoy out in an enclosed lake, then we move to Puget Sound, and then we do a bunch of open ocean tests uh, and we've had about close to 500 successful buoy days of tracking using the system. Uh, and what I think I'll do in the interest of time is compress the talk and skip the next five slides and move right to the results from the last, uh, uh, the last deployment. Uh, I will say, maybe I'll stop briefly on this slide, which shows, I just want to give you a sense for what the measurements look like, what the solution looks like. The data come back to us, the raw data. The buoy's not computing its height. We're taking the raw data back and we're doing precise point positioning. Uh, and what you can see here is a time series over a couple of days of the buoy height represented by these tiny green dots. And it's highly scattered. That's not an error in the GPS solution. That's just because we are sampling individual waves. So the buoy is going up and down with the waves. It's also going up and down with the tides. And these dots here represent the geocentric sea surface height from a radar altimeter on a satellite as it flies over the buoy. So you can see there's very good agreement. You have to do some smoothing of the wave effects. But when we do this, we get agreement at the two to three centimeter level between the geocentric height from the buoy and the <coughs> geocentric height from the satellite. Okay, so this is the last test that we just completed. So I wanna introduce you to the Harvest platform. This is off the coast of uh, Southern California. It's right at the tip of Point Conception. It's right uh, kind of where the California coast goes from east-west trending to north-south trending. It's a great location for doing a stress test for the buoy because there are very active seas out there. Uh, it's at the, uh, basically the intersection where the Santa Barbara Channel enters the Pacific Ocean. And the, the seas there, as you can see from this picture, especially in the winter, we get some very big storms and they're typical of the open ocean. So it's a great test location because it's close to shore, but we have high seas. And also it's served as an altimeter verification site since 1992. So we have 
multiple GPS receivers <coughs> and multiple tide gauges, which we can use to provide verification of the buoy results. <coughs> so what we did is we deployed a couple of these buoys up by the platform, shown in this, uh, this picture here. This is the satellite ground track from the, the JSON satellite. It, it traces this ground track exactly every 10 days. Here's our oil platform. And the two buoys were moored in about 300 meters of water, about a kilometer and a half apart. So these three form a triangle. Here we have GPS and tide gauges on a platform fixed to the ocean floor. And here we have the buoys. So we're gonna make some comparisons between the two. And we put these out there in August of last year with the idea to try to go through uh, at least some of the winter so we could get some really high sea states and see when the buoy performance started to degrade. <coughs> we also equipped the buoys with load cells because one of the issues we have is measuring how the water line changes as the mooring pulls in the buoy, right? So if you have very high tides and active seas and the mooring is on the edge of the watch circle, it's gonna get pulled into the water. And if you don't know that, it's gonna make it look like the sea level's dropping. So we put a, a couple load cells on the buoys and we also upgraded the telemetry so that we got one minute snapshots of the GPS tracking data, which allows us to do sort of decimeter level positioning. But we really need the one hertz data to get the, down to the centimeter level. <coughs> so this is just a plot showing uh, over a hundred days, the comparison between the two buoys and the tide gauge in the top panel. Uh, and you, you can't tell the difference essentially. These are peak to peak variations of two meters that are due to ocean tides essentially. Uh, semi-diurnal and diurnal ocean tides, but all systems line up pretty well. You can look at the differences and what you see is agreement sort of at the two centimeter level. These are hourly averages of, of data, so you can envision taking averages over longer periods over several days to further reduce the errors. What you do see, if you look at the bottom panel, is a significant correlation with the, uh, the wave height, the significant wave height. So the typical wave height at harvest is a couple meters, sort of what we see in the open ocean. But then, as I mentioned earlier, during occasional periods, we're up to over six meters here. And you can see there's some issues with the solution. Uh, it starts to break down. At this point in time, we could have sea spray, we could have spume and all kinds of things going over the top of the buoy. So this was a good thing. We wanted to see when this was gonna start happening. And we feel very comfortable with the results up to about significant wave heights of four meters. After that, it gets a little bit dodgy with this particular platform. The other thing you notice is there's some sy systematic error that's related to wave height that remains in both of the solutions. Some of this could be coming from the tide gauge. It's very hard to measure water level at the platform because of these waves, and some of it's probably due to the buoy. If you look at the differences between the two buoys, now you can see we're at the sub-centimeter level. So there's some systematic air in there, but in terms of the relative positioning and height, it's uh, very accurate, and that has a lot of applications too. Um, so to summarize, uh, the results are, are very promising. I think the comparisons with independent observations suggest uh, the accuracy in height is close to two centimeters. And by independent observations, I mean not only tide gauges, but satellite radar altimeter measurements from, uh, from uh, <coughs> space-borne systems. Uh, we think the horizontal accuracies are probably similar. Uh, we don't have a means of validating that. For relative uh, height, we're down below a centimeter. And uh, hopefully you'll agree that this might uh, uh, provide a model for an improved acoustic observation system for C4 geodesy, enables accurate and continuous access to the reference frame, does not require a dedicated reference station on land, and it's capitalizing on a simple power conserving design to provide accurate positioning and orient, uh, orientation for a hydrophone. Reduces burden on costly campaign style ship based measurements and uh, adaptable to other platforms. And so we're working on this last part here and, and hopefully we'll have some data from uh, a sail drone here in the near future. And the other thing I wanna mention is it's not just the height and the position, it's also the fact that we can measure total electron time which uh, enables characterization of, of ionospheric disturbances uh, from tsunamis and or possible precursor events. And then there's some challenges we're, we're looking at. I think 
they relate mainly to telemetry and power, but these advances in these areas are occurring so quickly, I'm confident that we'll be fine. The new Iridium Next system is supposed to enable 10 times the throughput for these transmissions. And then uh, most of our deployments so far have been uh, no solar panels, just using batteries. And uh, we're gonna do a one year deployment with some new batteries, but we also have some designs that reflect the addition of a solar panel. So I think I'll conclude with that. And, uh, if there's any questions or not? Okay. All right. And I think he's actually speaking to us from his car, correct? And it's Bud Vincent from URI. I think he's pulled over. Told he's pulled over. <laughs> can anyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Hey, Bud, will you be sharing your slides? Oh, there we go. Can you, see my, can you see my slides? Yes, we yes, can. can. Okay. Um, it doesn't look like the slideshow wants to start. There we go. Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. So, um, Sorry, I couldn't be there in person. I, uh, I'm, I'm on the road. I'm stopped. I'm in a parking lot in New Jersey. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> and but telecommunications is a wonderful thing. I just left a, a three day conference at Pennsylvania State University on underwater acoustic transducers. So that's one of my one of my areas of interest. But that's not what I'm here to talk about, although it is somewhat relevant. Um, I'm here to talk about the use of uh, uh, GPS and underwater acoustics to facilitate uh, C4 geodesy. And what I want to talk about specifically is some of the work that I've done over the last 20 years um, on seafloor geodesy. I suspect most people have never heard of me or my work because most of my work has been done for the Navy. And so what I'd like to do is go through that a little bit and then perhaps um, leave off with some suggestions for some future work and it ties in nicely with some of the slides that I just saw regarding uh, robotic platforms because I agree 100% that the time is ripe right now to bring these robotic platforms into the picture to facilitate economic uh, data collection to support seafloor geodesy. Um, so my bottom line up front, and I'm sure there'll be more discussion, I suspect, uh, when we have the panel discussion, and that is, um, in my opinion, long-term seafloor geodesy is economically feasible by combining three things, underwater acoustics, GPS, and autonomous surface vehicles. But I will challenge the status quo, which always defaults right now to using transponders. And there are other seafloor sensors that are available and are better for long-term seafloor geodesy. Uh, specifically, they are beacons and hydrophones, and I'll discuss briefly the differences between those and why you might want to consider using those alternatives. Um, I'm going to tell you that, in my opinion, a hydrophone with an acoustic modem offers the opportunity to provide the highest accuracy geodetic measurements on the seafloor, as well as the lowest power for long duration deployments. And by long duration, I'm meaning at least 25 year long deployments of the seafloor sensors. And these are not tabled sensors back to shore, okay? So what is a transponder? A transponder is a device that transmits a reply pulse after receiving an interrogation pulse. So whether it's a wave glider, sail drone, or manned surface vessel, you transmit from the surface, it gets received on the bottom, and the bottom transmits a reply back for every single ranging, measurements that, ranging measurement that you want to obtain. A beacon, on the other hand, is a device that sits on the seafloor. You send a signal to it, once transmission from the surface, and then it transmits repeatedly for an extended period of time afterwards. 
Okay, and that period of time would typically be the observation campaign that your surface platform, as it maneuvers in a geometry around the seafloor sensor, would, would go. So, tipic, so for the Navy ones, we've done these beacons, we let them run for say four hours, and then we're out of the area and we've moved on to the next one. A hydrophone just receives the pulses. Why is that important? That's important because acoustic transmissions require how high power, high power being hundreds of watts. Uh, especially if we're going to talk about capabilities down to full ocean depth on the order of 6,000 meters. But acoustic reception on the seafloor only requires milliwatts of power. Um, so if we can minimize the transmissions from the seafloor, we can have a very small package and it can last for a very long time and we can get a very large number of observations that allow us to compute positions. Okay. We do have to get the data from the seafloor to the surface, and that's why a hydrophone coupled with an acoustic modem represents the lowest possible power uh, per slant range measurement that we get as the observable to, to make geodetic position computations. So typically, uh, what has been done in the past when I initially got into this business back in the 90s was we would drive out with a manned surface ship. We have hydrophones down on the seafloor. And the hydrophones were able to uh, be time synchronized with the transmissions from the surface ship because of GPS. Okay, so we have to solve that problem without with uh, the lack of time synchronization uh, if we're going to have this untethered device sitting on the seafloor. And that's why transponders have typically been used in the past. Now, though, as I'll show um, or comment on, Scale atomic clocks have been have been developed that give us very precise time synchronization on the seafloor in a very small battery powered form factor. So the traditional positioning models that have been used on the seafloor positioning um, and in GPS consist of spherical uh, models. So uh, and these are long baseline multilateration models, hyperbolic models, and the reason there's one uh, each. Uh, excuse me, two each for spherical and hyperbolic is it has to do with the um, number of transmitters and the number of receivers. So the second one in, I, in each of these, um, and let's see if my mouse will come through. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So here, uh, the, the T sub, uh, the T A I, the I indicates how many, um, uh, observations I'll be making. Um, so th this is time of emission. And if I have a single time of emission, but multiple time of arrival measurements, I would employ this model. If I have many, many time of emissions, and also many, many time of arrivals, I would apply this model. So this one here for spherical and this one here uh, for hyperbolic is for GPS at a, at a most at a fundamental level and of course for GPS with your cell phone handheld GPS receiver because you don't carry around an atomic clock synchronized with the clocks and the satellites you have to solve for your user clock bias in your uh, local uh, GPS receiver and I'll skip the yeah, yeah I just I would just want to remind you that we don't we only have a few more minutes okay. otherwise we use up our discussion time so sure. Okay, I'll cut to the chase. We've developed two new models that allow us to remove the single most uh, important error contribution, which is the effective sound velocity of the sound speed in the ocean. So <laughs> two new models that were developed. Um, we estimate not only the uh, geocentric position of the acoustic receiver in an Earth-centered, Earth-fixed coordinate system represented by XYZ, but we also can solve for a timing bias as well as a sound speed bias. And we've conducted a series of computer simulations and predicted what the uh, bias errors would look like and how we would remove those. And that's indicated here for the various models, the traditional spherical and hyperbolically squares, and then the spherical and hyperbolically squares with the sound velocity bias estimation. And this is some data from back in the late 90s where we went to sea in the depth of about 1700 <laughs> meters, put sensors down, on the seafloor, cabled back to shore and validated these models. And we, this was done down at the US Navy facility in the tongue of the ocean in the Bahamas. And 
we did uh, about 100 of these seafloor sensors. Everywhere you see a crossing pattern of the ship, there's a seafloor sensor. And the bottom line is our models agree with the simulations. We believe we have effectively removed the sound speed bias and we are getting sub-centimeter positioning using the combined acoustic and GPS data. And this is a comparison with carrier phase. This was post-process carrier phase data. And let me jump ahead. This is portable sensors. So we extended this technique to portable sensors. Again, one-way acoustic transmissions. We are not transponding. And the conclusions, and we can have a conversation with it, um, we basically have developed th uh, low power acoustic seafloor instruments over about three generations for the Navy. Um, our models and our algorithms, um, we believe we are about, uh, because of the bias removal with these uh, new models, we are well below a centimeter in terms of our geodetic position. Um, surface system with autonomous vessels can be used for the transmissions and if we put hydrophones with an acoustic modem on the seafloor, they are economically feasible and they can last an extremely long period of time. And on the left here is an example of a seafloor sensor um, that could run. <coughs> this one here could easily run for 10 years. And just in case you're not aware, sail drone is not the only game in town for unmanned uh, wind powered vessels. These are data morans and they can stay out at sea transmitting acoustic ranging signals to the seafloor picked up by this uh, seafloor sensor on the left which then transmits those via acoustic telemetry back to the data moran and back to shore and, I, and with that i will answer any questions now or defer until we have the panel discussion so isabel and by um, sarah and Bruce are here at the table and we're opening the floor then to questions uh, to any speaker in this uh, this first part of uh, panel two. Questions? A question? Yeah. Uh, I have a question for either Bruce or Isabel. The geo changes related to this precursor mm -hmm. candidate uh, before Tohoku, would it produce sea level changes large enough to be measured by Bruce's system. I don't know how big that is. Yeah, I defer to you. Um, yeah. <laughs> the the co-seismic change uh, is about is uh, at millimetric level on the geoid uh, at great resolution. So um, if this is a large scale anomaly. It should be me below the millimetric level, I think. Otherwise, uh, we would see it more easily in GWID data, uh, in GWID data directly, without performing a gradient analysis. Great, thank you. Question. Uh, another question for Dr. Panay. In terms of the precursory signal, I suppose nothing was seen for the large Indonesia earthquake where the co seismic part has been discussed for Grace for a while. Is that correct? Uh, I'm aware only on uh, this study on the Tohoku earthquake. And okay. we are studying the Maule earthquake, but for Indonesia, I don't know. Okay. Have I have a Hi, question for uh, Bud, or two quick questions. Um, you mentioned the horizontal accuracy of about 0.1 centimeter. What's your vertical accuracy is the first question. And then the second one is, what's, what's the cost of the system you showed the picture of at the end, the, the seafloor, um, uh, hydrophone, and, and modem, and then the, the, um, the surface what, it's sail system, whatever, whatever you use? Yes, can, can you hear me OK? Yep. Okay, the um, vertical accuracy is determined by the vertical accuracy of the GPS. For prior work that I did due to uncertainty in the geoid height model, mm -hmm. um, as well as tidal correction, we felt that we were about 10 centimeters vertically. Now, I think that can be improved, but it's directly related to the GPS and not as much to the acoustic ranging measurements per se. Okay. The, the horizontal, um, we, we actually think we can do better than a, than a millimeter um, 
with enough observations with the right distribution around the seafloor sensor. The, the cost, the, the most expensive piece right now is the chip scale atomic clock. And those prices have just gone up recently from about $1,500 to $4,500. So the seafloor sensor is going to be about a $30,000 instrument. We are looking at some clocks that have just been recently developed to compete with the atomic clocks. And if we can model the drift on those sufficiently and remove it, we may be able to bring the price down um, by another few thousand dollars. The surface systems, I don't have a cost on because most of the surface wind-powered vessel providers will not sell you a wind-powered vessel. They want to sell you services. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, yeah. I'll just reinforce with our system. Uh, we we do think now that the state of the art for GPS uh, vertical in the water with a properly designed system is is a couple centimeters in instantaneous. And by that I mean if you get to average over about an hour high rate data, and if you average over multiple days, uh, uh, we think it's probably closer to one centimeter but it's uh, something we start to demonstrate. And it depends on the platform too, right? It depends on, uh, we need to test this system on, on other platforms. We understand our system very well now, but we need to, we need to deploy it on, on, uh, on gliders and, and sail drones and see what we get. Oh. Yeah, I wanted to follow up with Isabel on, the, you showed that the co-seismic signal is sort of speared along strike much farther than the predicted signal uh, yes. and I'm wondering about in the time domain is it possible is your filtering in the time domain fully causal or is it possible that some of the co-seismic signals being aliased into the pre-seismic? Uh, you're, you're speaking of the co-seismic? Well I said the co-seismic was clearly smeared out laterally it extends much farther than the prediction yes and I'm wondering whether there could be temporal the filtering could project some of the co-seismic into the pre-seismic period. Uh, um, I think uh, there are two levels. Uh, one is in our analysis, and the second is uh, before our analysis in the way uh, the GeoID models are built months per month. And uh, the fact that uh, we detect an anomaly in time series truncated in February 2011, so before, before the step, uh, means that there is no filtering effect in the analysis uh, we have run itself. Uh, that's why we carried out two, two kinds of analysis. Then there is the way <coughs> the GWID models are built uh, before we start anything and uh, each month they are computed months per month uh, independently uh, from the next month and the orbits also are computed day per day uh, so we did not expect uh, any kind of, uh, of propagation but then uh, uh, yeah <laughs> or something we, we would not think about <laughs> Okay. Yeah, it's so Ben Phillips, is that? Okay. Ben? Sorry. Hey, Andy, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, this is Ben Phillips at, at NASA headquarters. Um, a question for, uh, for Bruce and, and Bud. I, I'm interested in um, the, the error budgets for uh, the seafloor geodesy problem and uh, sort of, you know, looking at the sea surface to satellite component versus the sea surface to sea floor components and you know where you see in addition to these these great you know technology developments that that seem to improve the logistics and cost case you know where you see opportunity for improving precision uh, bringing down integration time those sorts of things from the GPS standpoint I think it's uh, one of the biggest challenges is is uh, is monitoring how much the the water level is changing relative to the face center of the GPS antenna. Uh, also, multipath and separation of uh, tropospheric signal from vertical height for an isolated buoy. 
Um, but in terms of, I, I would say the water level measurements might be, if I had to guess, might be the biggest component of the air budget. And that's why we're expending effort putting these load cells and other systems on there. And also we use this digital compass so we can precisely model the orientation of the buoy in, in much the same way we do with the satellite in space, right? We're always monitoring the position of the antenna face center relative uh, to the, the reference system of the buoy. Uh, so those, those are the areas that we're focusing on. Do you have to worry about monument settling? Do these things sink into the mud? Well, this, the buoy is just floating on the water. The underwater part, I'd, I'd have to defer to, to uh, Bud Vincent on that part. Uh, it's certainly possible that the sensor could settle into the sediment, and that would have to be uh, distinguished distinguish somehow from the, the uh, seafloor changing, changing its height. And you can put pads down on the feet of the sensors, but you know, they might be able to do something with a very short distance laser to measure settling, local settling of the device into the sediment on the seafloor. It's difficult. There has been some discussion about setting up the benchmark by putting a, driving a long pipe down into the uh, seafloor so that it doesn't settle vertically. Um, so, and I, I believe that's being done in the oil and gas industry, in fact, as they set up these production areas and they want to measure local deformation as they produce an area. Other questions? Um, I mentioned one other thing about error budget, if I may. The, as far as acoustic ranging is concerned, um, just from an acoustic signaling standpoint, we can get uh, better than a centimeter resolution on our range measurements. It's the bias errors that kill you um, and that's why it requires the, the modeling of the sound speed to remove that component. And I suspect something similar must have to happen in the GPS propagation uh, of the electromagnetic signal from the satellite to the receivers. Okay, so I have a question for Sarah. So I really like this kind of approach of, you know, where's the optimal, you know, Station by station, where should we put it? So, the, but well, the bit I don't quite, or at least I can't get my head around. So, Wonder Fuka Plate, great. Then the next twenty-ish, we're all right along the trench. But does does the analysis really mean right along the trench, as opposed to some sort of distribution um, to to see the deformation? Because there's presumably some sort of deformation within the the overriding plate. And so, the idea that the next twenty would all be right along the trench. I'm a little surprised by. So can you talk us through whether that's that's really one of the conclusions to draw or? Well, of course you're talking about Eileen's work, so mostly I'd like to answer that question with a shadow puppet. Um, but other than that, I mean, that is genuinely what the importance is, right? We start with this very dense grid. It, it absolutely has the, the opportunity to put those stations farther down. You can see those color maps of, of the relative entropy, you know, all over the whole region, which is all the places you could put a, uh, fault. And it, the, the entropy really does grade up towards the trench, which may, kind of makes sense. I mean, again, it, it is kind of shocking how much it is near the trench, but at the same time, if you turn around and you look at those maps of where the uncertainty was on the coupling models, the, they grade up to the trench. The biggest uncertainties are near the trench, and they decrease as you get closer and closer to land. And so if you ask the question, where do I want to go put out my stations, it turns out that the entropy thinks it's along the trench where those uncertainties are largest. And presumably if you were to subdivide the overriding plate, you would get a different answer allowing it, for this sort of information. It's tessellated. But even in terms of the parameterization of the model, right, so there's a, there's a distribution of where you could put the station, yes. and then there's an assumption in your model, or you're asking for a specific model of what's the entropy. What if you were to change the parameterization in that model? Yeah, so it's a function of the parameterization. So, you know, presumably, if I made this, you know, these patches really, really big, then you would only need a few stations along the trench in order to say, I know everything that's going on along the trench. And, you know, if I had made those patches really, really, really tiny, maybe once the first 50 stations near the trench, because boy, there's a lot of patches out there that I don't know anything about. It is absolutely, yeah. the argument, yeah. I mean, one part of the argument though is that a cable array, a dense cabled array is not the, in any way the geometry to inform, right? 
I mean, from your from your analyses. Yes, Paul. Richard and Torsten are saying is that you have epistemic uncertainty. These are all modulo the forward model being a particular elastic model. Right. And if you start allowing inelastic deformation in the trench, then you may get a different answer. Sure, absolutely. This is absolutely model dependent. And again, this wasn't this isn't even just a matter of you know, elastic forces and elastic, it's also a question of the fact that like in that particular example, we said, I want to know about coupling, right? If you had said something else, I want to know about slip rate or total slip rate or something else, you could have gotten yet a different answer because that requires a different set of observations and you have different interests in different variances and covariances. I just want to clarify that. Anyway, I, if there's one more short question, otherwise we'll... We'll wrap up now and have a coffee break for 10 minutes.